Everyone loves cartoon violence. And Tom and Jerry have been serving it up for nearly a century. But are the cat and mouse really a good fit for the movies? That's the question I'm going to answer, and there's a lot to talk about, so follow me down the mouse hole. So we know that cartoon characters can work in a full-length live-action movie because we have one stellar example in Who Framed Roger Rabbit, but there's a ton of reasons why no one else has managed to reproduce the formula. I'll give you two, food for thought, before turning to the 2021 Tom and Jerry movie. First, Who Framed Roger Rabbit had one of the best all-time production crews bringing it to life in an act of shared artisanship. Amblin Entertainment under Steven Spielberg did the producing, George Lucas's Industrial Light and Magic handled the practical effects, a true artist in Richard Williams oversaw animation, Robert Zemeckis directed the film, Bob Hoskins and Christopher Lloyd turned in inspired performances, and Roger Rabbit also had a raft of vocal talent, including legend Mel Blanc. I like the sound of that. Add in a once-in-a-lifetime level of cooperation between Disney and Warner Brothers, and we may never see this much creative talent working together again in Hollywood, especially given the upheaval the industry is going through now. With tons of independent content to compete with, it's going to be tougher and tougher for Hollywood to round up enough creativity to manage something worth your attention, much less something that could compete with Roger Rabbit's mastery. Not gonna happen. Not anymore. But here's the bigger advantage Roger has over the cat and mouse. He, along with Jessica Rabbit and Baby Herman, were first created for novels, for books, not for a visual medium. They were verbal before they were visual. So even though we think of them as cartoons, they aren't just slapstick types. Don't assume it's Roger's slapstick antics that make him a compelling character. That's only part of his character. Him, along with Jessica and Herman, are fully developed actors with human-like motivations, fears, and thoughts. That's what the film's brilliant first couple scenes are for, to demonstrate that Roger Rabbit's slapstick is, to an extent, just an act. There's more going on beyond the tune antics. With human characterization and human communication, Roger Rabbit's cartoon cast was a perfect fit for a standard movie plot. Tom and Jerry, you'll note, aren't interesting in the same way. That doesn't mean the cat and mouse aren't movie material, but let's look at why they don't work with your typical plot-driven movie and why they don't work with live actors. I've got six points. Number one, Tom and Jerry don't talk. Okay, well, not often. Secondary characters, spike foremost, articulate constantly. But there's only a handful of episodes where the pair speak clearly. Personal favorites are this one. What's jumping, chick? And this one. Homo esta astad sin sinorita. Rare exceptions aside, their communication is purely physical, consisting of head shakes, nods, and gestures mostly. Human actors are different, obviously, as they do most of their communication by flapping their mouth holes. They're responsible for driving plot and delivering exposition, after all. That means Tom and Jerry don't speak the same language as the other cast members, which has a material effect on chemistry. This was a fatal problem with the 2021 movie. Only a couple scenes involve meaningful interactions between Tom, Jerry, and human cast members. The rest are either T and J beating each other up, which we like, or humans babbling about ugh, plot stuff. We don't like that, and it feels like two films loosely tied together instead of one cohesive experience. We're here to slurp up the cartoon hijinks, so why not dispense with the live-action stuff altogether? After all, animators can develop funnier human characters where needed, as the classic episodes demonstrate. Tom and Jerry are also a slapstick act, not a narrative-driven duo. This feeds into the first problem. In addition to being near-mutes, TNJ aren't motivated by plot because in most cases they're focused on smacking each other around. Even when the two are cooperating toward a shared objective, it's designed for an 8-12 to 12 minute short, bite-sized. The Babysitter episodes are a good example of this, and while it would be simple and effective to make an entire movie out of chasing a cartoon baby around, there's not much room to fit in live action or actors. So there's a disconnect in communication and a disconnect in motivation between TNJ and their human co-stars. Here's another problem. The real world cannot simulate the chaos that TNJ caused during their scuffles. In cartoon world where the physics are made up and the injuries don't matter, objects can be smashed and bashed, crushed and mushed, splintered and rent apart. <coughs> Animators can use their imagination to destroy stuff in the most humorous way possible. 
In live action world, everything is confined to our relatively boring physics. In this scene, the filmmakers try to bring this Tom and Jerry feature to life, and while I have a ton of respect for the effort put into these practical effects, most of this stuff is just falling over out of frame. That's because real life objects don't break in the same funny way, so the filmmakers don't show you any of it. This takes a lot of punch and humor out of Tom and Jerry's violence. Here's another problem. With live action, production crews are limited to only one or a few major shooting locations, so it's difficult to switch from one setting to another convincingly. That's another limitation on the Tom and Jerry formula because part of the fun is watching the pair represented throughout time and space. Though they do most of their damage at home, TNJ are equally at home at the bowling alley, farm, city, golf course, fishing hole, concert hall, beach, tennis court, the Wild West, pool hall, deserted island, the land of wine, cheese, and guillotines, cruise ship, Vienna, Italy, witch's lair, railroad track, Spain, Sherwood Forest, mad scientist lair, ancient Greece, space, the Caribbean, Captain Ahab ship, Kenya, construction yard, department store, dueling field, circus, movie theater, alpine, space station, cannery, secret hideout, and cheese planet, among other locales. With animation comes setting flexibility and Tom and Jerry take advantage of it. That's lost with live action to the pair's detriment. Velocity is another issue because live action is too slow for the pair. Tom and Jerry are at their best when they're moving as all slapstick characters are. Fortunately, simulating speed is pretty straightforward in animation. Blur the character's limbs while in motion, rocket them through the air, move the background, etc. In live action world, filmmakers can do some of this with clever editing and camera movement, but it's still a tough sell because we humans are well adapted to the speed of real life. Animators can pull out all sorts of tricks to sell the speed illusion, but with live action you've got to move the camera around to get that needed velocity, which is a challenge. Or additional technology has to fill in the gaps, which costs money. The speed differential between cartoon and human is most noticeable when live actions attempt to physically react to what the tunes are doing, which is partly why it looks weird when an actor tries it. Okay, now let's talk about Immedius Race. That's Latin, so you know it's old and smart, and it translates to in the midst of things. In storytelling, when storytellers like authors or filmmakers use Immedius Race, that means they're starting a scene in the middle, chronologically. The action is already going when the scene begins, in other words. This cool little trick works perfectly for Tom and Jerry because you, the viewer, implicitly understand what's going on no matter how the two are pummeling each other. You read the visual language instantly. There's the cat, there's the mouse, they don't like each other, and that's it. You got a PhD in TNJ. So no matter how the scene begins, you're along for the ride. For most movies though, In Medias Race is too jarring for the audience. That's because it's difficult for viewers to track the plot if there isn't time to orient when a new scene starts. That's another tool out of the Tom and Jerry arsenal, unfortunately. Okay, time for a verdict. Do Tom and Jerry fit into a movie format? I say yes, but not live action. Not at all. Well, maybe if you have Jim Carrey starring opposite TNJ because he's the only actor left who can match the pair's physical expression. He did make Sonic work, after all. But barring such a casting coup, a Tom and Jerry movie should be built on animation and animation only. For example, scale the runaway baby plot up to movie length and have the little tot crawl his way into a heavily guarded military base. As the cat, mouse, and baby infiltrate deeper and deeper into the base, they set off all kinds of experimental weaponry, run into captive aliens, or have an entire armored unit chasing after them. Maybe the base's ranking general is a bit nuts and mistakes Tom and Jerry for spies or something like that. Anyway, you guys can come up with some better ideas, I'm sure. The point is, is that Tom and Jerry are much more effective if you keep them in their dimension. They're too colorful and too chaotic for ours. I'm Kevin with The Professionals. Until next time, friends.